Georgia's DBHDD has an urgent health warning. One of every 10 counterfeit pills contain fentanyl, a powerful and very deadly drug. Pills from friends or dealers are unsafe, and one pill can cause an overdose. More info at opioidresponse.info. Welcome to the Georgia Today podcast from GPB News. Today is Tuesday, October 24th. I'm Peter Biello. On today's episode, the Georgia Supreme Court allows the state's abortion ban to stay in place, another guilty plea in the 2020 election interference racketeering case, and the city of Atlanta is forced to shut down several firehouses due to equipment and firefighter shortages. These stories and more are coming up on this edition of Georgia Today. The Georgia Supreme Court will allow the state's six-week abortion ban to stand. GPB Sarah Callis has more on the ruling from the court today. The court reversed an earlier decision by a lower court judge to block the law. Fulton County Judge Robert McBurney alleged it was void because abortions and pregnancies up to 20 weeks were legal in every state in 2019 when the law was passed. The Georgia Supreme Court sided with the state, saying the legislature was allowed to write new laws challenging current ones. Georgia State University law professor Anthony Michael Kreiss said the decision still leaves some questions unanswered. What was not answered by either the district or the, the Superior Court trial judge, Judge McBurney, or the Georgia Supreme Court was whether there's a fundamental right to abortion access under the Georgia Constitution. Abortion after six weeks of pregnancy remains illegal in Georgia with few exceptions. For GPB News, I'm Sarah Callis. Attorney Jenna Ellis today became the fourth defendant to enter a guilty plea in Georgia's 2020 election interference racketeering case. GPB's Stephen Fowler has more. Ellis was once part of Donald Trump's, quote, elite strike force team litigating efforts to overturn his 2020 election defeat. Now she's agreed to one felony count of aiding and abetting false statements and writings, which comes with five years probation, a $5,000 fine, community service and more. In a tearful statement to the judge, Ellis apologized for her actions, which included pushing false claims about Georgia's vote count and election systems at a state Senate hearing in 2020. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. Ellis is the fourth defendant to take a plea deal, joining attorneys Kenneth Chesbro and Sidney Powell and bail bondsman Scott Hall in avoiding jail time, a lengthy trial, or harsher penalties under the racketeering case. For GPB News, I'm Stephen Fowler. Coca-Cola is raising its full-year revenue forecast after a stronger-than-expected third quarter. The Atlanta beverage giant said its net revenue grew 8% to nearly $12 billion. That topped the $11.4 billion Wall Street forecast. That's according to analysts polled by FactSet. The city of Atlanta is temporarily closing three of its 30 fire stations because of truck breakdowns and a shortage of firefighters. Atlanta Fire Rescue Chief Roderick Smith told a city council committee that the department had 17 fire trucks out of service yesterday. 11 vehicles are on order, but delayed because of manufacturing backlogs. He also says the number of emergency calls has doubled compared to last year. Council members are considering a request to spend more than $16 million to buy a dozen more fire engines and other vehicles, but they might not arrive for another three years. Two Northwest Georgia health providers are combining. Atrium Health Floyd said yesterday that it has acquired Northwest Georgia Medical Clinic. Atrium Health Floyd operates three hospitals and employs about 3,500 employees in the region. Northwest Georgia Medical Center provides obstetrical, gynecological, and family medical services in Rome. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens has appointed the city's first-ever labor commissioner. John Flanagan will lead the city's Department of Labor and Employment Services. The department was created last year to expand employment resources and fair labor practices and to oversee job training programs in Atlanta. Flanagan comes from Florida, where he most recently served as president and CEO of CareerSource Tampa Bay. As the Atlanta metro area grows, leaders of its popular Beltline Trail are looking for ways to reduce the city's reliance on cars. Beltline and city leaders met this morning for an update on the 22-mile pedestrian and bike-friendly path around the city. Leaders say more than 85 percent will be under construction or completed by the end of next year. Beltline CEO Clyde Higgs says the path is meant to give people options to reach schools, hospitals, and restaurants. Whatever it is that really contributes to, to your life, we want to create these whole communities where you don't have to necessarily get in a personal vehicle. 
Plans for the Beltline include some light rail on the East Side Trail, which critics say could change the character of the path. The entire path circling the city is scheduled to be completed by 2030. Macon's downtown Bibb Theater opened in the 1930s but has been shuttered for decades. Now it's getting some action. The facade of the historic theater will play host to an outdoor classic film series this fall that kicked off this weekend with an inaugural lighting of the theater's billboard. While the future of the building remains unknown, Macon residents hold fond memories of its past. GPB's Sophie Gratis has more in this audio postcard. Popcorn's ready for people. You want some popcorn? This is a film series where we're screening classic movies that would have been made during the time that the Bibb Theater was open, about 1938 to 1964. My name is Emily Hawkins, and I am the Vice President of External Affairs at Newtown Macon. So we're kicking it off with Rear Window, which is a Hitchcock thriller, um, just in time for spooky season. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Classes at the Bibb. I'm Scott Mitchell. I am um, on the Main Street Board and I serve as the treasurer this year. Emily and I had worked on another grant for downtown. We were standing right there and we looked up at the bib and said, we can probably project movies onto that building if we can figure out how to do it. And so we wrote a grant. We jumped at the opportunity to save Macon, or downtown Macon's last remaining historic theater, but it's been at least 40 years since it was opened to the public. and operating. Do you want to share a name? Okay, it's Candy, Candy Brewer. On Saturday, you come down, down to the theater, and we just always did. But there were about five downtown theaters, but Bib was one of the newer ones, and we always, it was always one of the best. I can't remember the films. It, I don't remember exactly. It seems like it had the red chairs, you know, the red upholstered chairs. Sure. And like I said, it was one of the newer ones, so it was always real nice. But, uh, I was hoping they could have a theater here and show classics inside. <laughs> Just how would you start to cut up a human body? Jeff, I'll be honest with you. You're beginning to scare me. People don't realize what they're missing. The, 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 you know, I mean, you see your friends, you see... You know, it, it's just fun. This is what the old theaters used to be like. Ken McCune. Maddie Fisher. You know, it's nice to have the videos on TV and everything, but this is fun. Why don't they reopen this theater? They need to bring it back. We've been working for the past several years to stabilize the building. We had to rebuild the floor. The um, building itself was in pretty bad shape. Um, right now, it's kind of an empty shell, so there aren't the um, theater seats in it anymore. Um, it's kind of just an open room, so it really is kind of a blank slate for anybody who has an idea. So I want y'all to all look at your neighbors, and I want y'all to say, hey, y'all. I need, I need y'all to do that, because we need the real community here to make it. With that being said, we are now going to light the Bib Theater for the first time in 40 years. Five, four, three... Two, one. You just heard from Emily Hopkins with Newtown Macon, local business owner Scott Mitchell, and other Macon residents at a screening of Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window, the first at the city's Bibb Theater in 40 years. And finally, a homeowner is mulling her next step after a company mistakenly demolished her home in southwest Atlanta. Susan Hodgson says she found a pile of rubble where her longtime family property used to be when she returned from vacation last month. Hodgson says she's in shock and furious. The company, you call it, we haul it, told WAGA-TV that it's investigating and working on a resolution. And that's it for this edition of Georgia Today. If you want to learn more about any of these stories, visit our website, gpb.org news. And if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast, take a moment and do it now. That'll keep us current in your podcast feed. And if you've got feedback or a story idea we should know about, send us a note by email. The address is georgiatoday at gpb.org. I'm Peter Biello. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. At a time when information continues to come at us faster and faster, sometimes you need to hit pause and rewind. 
NPR's Throughline takes you back in time to the source of the news stories filling your feed. Find NPR's Throughline wherever you get your podcasts.